All right, good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We ask you please have your hand upon our classes this morning. We thank you for letting us come to church, and please prepare our hearts now to receive uh, what you have for us in your word. And Lord, I pray to help each teacher guide us through your spirit as we speak and give us all ears to hear. And Lord, I pray you let us walk away today better than how we came. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you would, uh, younger kids, you can head out one of these back doors. Unfortunately, both of our normal Sunday school teachers are out today, and they're both a bit sick. So you have two different teachers to follow, but follow them out that back door. They'll get you to the right classroom. And for the adults, let's get Mark chapter 10, if you would, please. Mark chapter 10. And uh, today... We're looking at a tricky topic indeed, continuing our series in the tricky topics. Today we're talking about child care in church. Now I realize this, you may feel as you hear that, how does this apply to me? What could I possibly stand to learn from this? And granted for some of you, maybe the majority of you, it is not immediately um, apparent how this is going to play out in your life, but as a local church, it is good that we know what does the Bible say about it, if anything. And how are we as a local church going to approach having little kids running around in the church? So Mark chapter 10 and verse number 13, it says, And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me for, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Now he goes on to bless them and use them as a bit of a sermon illustration for just a moment. But what we learn in this passage is that Jesus accommodates the little children being around him. Now let me be very, very clear about this, however. What you've just read, this is about as close as I could come for a verse that deals with children in church. There are no verses that speak about little kids in a local church in the New Testament. This, what we're reading here, this was not a church service. This is Jesus out and about, moving about in public, and people brought their, their infants to him, their young children to him, just asking him to bless them. And he accommodated that, right? The disciples were keen to keep the kids away. Don't bother the master. He's too busy for that. Jesus says, I'm not too busy for that. I like having the little kids around. But within the local church, I really would love to take you to some verse in Corinthians or uh, Galatians or something to say, here's what Paul said to do with kids during the church service. There is no verse like that. So that is what makes this topic a little bit tricky. I can only assume that since the beginning of the New Testament, this has always been a challenge. And I would say even back into the Old Testament, when the Jews just had their synagogues any time, and let's move it even outside of a church setting. Anytime you have a public gathering, what do you do with the kids? Right? They, the kids are going to be kids. They don't realize if this is a business meeting or a town hall meeting or a presidential debate or a local church. They don't know. They're little kids. So I'm assuming this has always been a challenge. And every culture, every church within that culture is probably going to handle this topic a little bit differently. They're going to put their own spin on it. I've had the uh, blessing of being around various cultures and being around a lot of different churches, so I've seen many different ideas on this. Uh, having spent almost nine years in Malawi, a little more than nine years there, I can tell you we're not going to institute our child care program from Malawi here. There's no way that would work. Uh, during my first six months, that was maybe the most difficult preaching I've ever done because when the Malawians come to church, this is just how they've always done it. David Livingston was the first one to trek through there, and then from his time there, many Presbyterian missionaries came in his, in his wake and set up mission stations and churches. And the way that they used to do it back in the 1800s was that the men would sit on one side and the women would sit on the other. So for the first many years of our church, I didn't know who was married to whom. Because in Malawi, the man, when you walk down the road, the man walks 10 steps ahead of his wife. So they don't walk together. They don't sit together. I could not figure out who goes with whom. It was a mystery to me. Furthermore, when it comes to the kids in the church, now this is just part of, and, and I think this is not just Malawian, but more African culture. When, it's, when the baby gets hungry, time to feed the baby. 
you don't go outside. There, I mean, you wouldn't be able to be a part of the service at all. You might as well go home. So mom just pulls the shirt aside and feeds the baby right there in church. But now the first, like I said, six months or so, I'm still getting initiated into African culture. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, oh, 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 okay. We'll just talk to the men. Just talk to the men. Azibambo, Mugujida Jani. And we just talked to them for a while. I thought, yo, oh, 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 oh. Let, just let mama finish and then we'll come. <laughs> it, it took time. It took time. Eventually, we had visitors come from America, you know, people on survey trips and mission trips and so forth. And I would let, you know, if there was a man that came on the trip, I'd give him an opportunity to preach. And he, I, I'm initiated. I don't even see it, right? I'm blind to it now. So I, I, it's happening. I'm sure it's happening, but I've, I see it all over the country, not just in church, walking down the road, in a minibus, taxi, I mean, everywhere. It's just happening. So I don't see it, but I could, it was almost like my little inside joke on the guy up there. I'm like, yeah, just wait for it, wait for it. He's up there, but yeah, the Bible says the Bible. <gasps> <gasps> you would think he had committed the unpardonable sin, you know? He's like, oh, oh. Now, th that I could deal with. That's part of the culture there, right? So that's, I, I, I didn't see a need to step in and change anything about that. It, it, I want to say it offended me in the beginning, but that it offended my American culture. It didn't offend anything biblical. It didn't offend anything spiritually in me. You understand the difference? Something might offend you culturally, and it may not be scripturally wrong. So you have to distinguish between those two. Now, I had to draw the line eventually because in Malawi, the kids would get up and we had benches because we rented a schoolroom for a long time. And when we, were, when we were in the schoolroom, they'd get up off the bench, they'd trot to the edge of the bench and just turn around and urinate there in the school. And then trot right back and sit next to their mom. And I thought, okay, culture or not, that's a no-no. We, we can't, we got to draw the line somewhere. Now, is there a verse in the Bible that says that's where the line should be drawn? Well, no, but I mean, common sense kicks in somewhere. And as the leader, I've got to say, that's going to be a bit too distracting. And, and one kid went beyond just number one <laughs> once. I thought, okay, I, I didn't know it was happening. It was in the back, but eventually, right, it became obvious to everybody something had happened and oh, it became a massive distraction in the church. Now listen, why do we come together every Sunday? Edification. We come to listen and learn. Anything that takes away from us trying to achieve that ultimate goal of listening and learning the Word of God, that's where we have to step in and say, let's give a little structure here to eliminate as many distractions as possible. You see? So that's, that's why we have this kind of lesson. Um, in America, when I was in Bible school, I was a member of Dr. Ruckman's church, and, and he would draw, I told you a couple Sundays ago, he would draw every Sunday night. He was a professional artist, so he'd have a massive board, and he'd pull out his chalk, and he would do a chalk talk. So he'd preach for about an hour, and the kids, all the kids in the church, we're about seven, 800 people in there, there would be at least 100 kids, uh, m maybe up to 100, that would fill what we called the orchestra pit because in Doc's church we had a, a small orchestra, small band if you will. Um, I mean, you know, the bass drum, trombones, tubas, everything. Dr. Ruckman played the tuba so you'd, we'd have a big orchestra there. The kids would come and it would fill up this entire area and they would lay on their stomachs with, their, with a book, a, you know, drawing paper and they'd have their pencils or pens and whatever Dr. Ruckman was drawing, those kids would try to duplicate that and they would take notes on the side. Now see, if I could draw, we might be, <laughs> then we'd have, we might be able to do something similar. But see, that's unique to that church. I, I didn't see that anywhere else. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one thing I saw over and over again. This is for the older kids now, mind you. Younger kids, which is what we're going to focus on, mom and dad, we're going to talk more about your responsibility towards that. But uh, in many churches, when the kids get a bit older, they have to sit in the front, right? Now, this is the parent's prerogative. I, I'm, I'm sure some churches probably make it mandatory, but I know a lot of them. It's just a prerogative thing if you're okay with it. But all the teenagers sit up in the front. So you'll have one or two pews filled with teenage girls and then the other side, teenage boys. And I've, I've always found that an interesting project because, I don't know, I was a teenage boy once. You put me in a pew or in a, in a row with 20 other guys, I don't know if I'm going to be paying attention 
as good as if I'm sitting next to my dad. I'm probably going to do better next to my dad as far as, you know, listening. Now, I, I will enjoy being with my friends a bit more, but even this last trip back to the States, I'm, I'm in the church, I'm preaching along, and I get to one of those, you know how it is in a sermon, you kind of build up to a serious moment where people really need to hear this one thing. It, it, the whole sermon kind of pivots on this statement. And right then, this one teenager up in the front he had slouched down so far, he almost fell off the chair. And he, he had a hat on, and it falls, and, and he's got his feet all out. And his mom comes trotting down to the front and whack, slaps him on the back of the head. <laughs> and then she trots back to her seat, and I thought, okay, let's try that point over again because this is where I needed everybody to really, you know, dial in. And instead of watching what was going on in the pulpit and, and what the Spirit of God might be trying to communicate, all those people saw, all 300 of them, all they saw was whack. That's, that was the message they got. Now, granted, I kind of agree with her method there. It, it worked. He needed a good wake-up call, but it was unfortunate, the timing of it. Now, those are the kind of things we would like to avoid if we can. So, let's uh, talk quickly. How do we avoid some of these distractions? Well, especially with little kids, Many churches will have a nursery. And like I said, in Malawi, we didn't have that. We just didn't have the space to do it, really. But, and even here, we're renting this place. There's only so much we can do. We can't renovate these rooms. So we have used that area, as, as many of you know, that four-year area is our mother's area, as, as we like to call it. Um, we do the best we can. And by the way, if any of you mothers back there watching, because we have a TV screen set up for them, I am always open to ideas. If there's something we can change, we would like to accommodate people as much as we can, right within reason. But that is one way of, of dealing with the distractions. If your child is acting up, if your child needs special attention, rather than doing it out here, you would take the child back there. Uh, help me with this word. You guys call it a creche? Is that the word? That, that's a new word to me. So uh, is that always nursery? Is that the same thing as a nursery? Yeah, a creche is a nursery. Okay, so if I say nursery, that doesn't confuse anybody. You, you don't think we're growing plants back there, do you? Okay, all right, just, just, just checking. Uh, gold medal, gold medal is to have your children with you in the service, right? Now, now that's in a perfect world. If we could draw up the utopian local church where every kid is perfectly behaved and never cries and only, you know, uh, it just sits still the whole service, it would be great to have the kids with you in the service. It's wonderful to be able to worship God as a family. And, and, and I'll tell you why. From a young age, those kids get to see this is important. And they get to see mom and dad taking it seriously. And I, and I know when they're one and two, they may not, it may not register with them. But you'd be surprised how many of those good habits they learn just sitting there next to you. Going, this is time to sit and be quiet. So if you can have them in the service and they are not causing a distraction, gold medal. Great. That, that's what we are aiming for. But that's not always going to be possible. And we know that. So that's why we have an area dedicated if your child is getting a bit, whatever, cranky, needs special attention, whatever the case is, just quietly step out and take them to the nursery. Guys, let's be honest. There is no perfect option, okay? We can set up a nursery, and there are, I'm going to explain a couple different approaches to the nursery. We can set that up, but please do not think that in this lesson, I'm going to give you the perfect way to deal with it. There is no perfect answer to this because every kid is different, every family is different, Every church is different, every building's different, and every week the kid might act differently. There's just no one static answer to this. So please do not think that if somebody has a child that acts up and needs to take them out, they've done something wrong. Or because there was noise during the service, well, the church isn't doing what they can. We're, we're trying, we're trying, but that's just part of life. We have to understand that. <clears throat> now, there are two approaches to nurseries. One, we call it a rotational approach. And in, when we get to our building, uh, we've already talked about this with the mothers. And to be honest, mothers, I'm still praying about this and thinking about it. The rotational uh, approach, we would have maybe two, maybe three mothers. It depends on how many kids or babies are in the nursery. Two or three mothers would be dedicated to be in that nursery watching over all the kids. 
So the other mothers would leave their children in the nursery. We would have a check-in and a check-out system so no one takes the wrong kid. <laughs> I'm serious. You have to do that, right? It's a smart thing to do. And, and, and this way you also have a check-in. What's their name? Any special dietary needs? Um, is, is there a... Uh, should we come and call you if they ask for this? Just any special instructions, you write that down. It gives you a chance to check their health. How, how sick do they need to be before you keep them home? Right? I mean, this is something every parent faces. You, have you ever woken up on a Sunday and said, I'm, I'm, on, that, I'm on the borderline, I'm, I'm just sick enough, I might get somebody else sick, maybe I won't. And it's tough to know with your kids because kids are walking Petri dishes. Right? They, they, they are bacteria factories. That's, they just snot running everywhere and spitting on things. And you give a one-year-old something, where does it go? <laughs> right to their mouth every time. That's just how it goes. So it's always going to be a challenge. Now, the rotational option, right? This gives mothers a chance on a rotation to be in the service uninhibited by their children. They get to pay attention and focus. So that's the upside to it. Right? The downside is somebody else is watching your kids. Right? Th that's the downside. So the other option is what we call a communal option. And this is much what we're doing now, uh, where mothers and sometimes even a father, if necessary, whoever needs to take their child to the nursery would go in the nursery. And every, every man for themselves, as they say, every mom for herself, you go and take care of your child during the service. Now, you say, which one should we do? Let's remember what's the goal. What's the goal? We want to come to church, listen, and learn with as few distractions as possible. So whichever nursery system we choose, right, we want to do our best to fit into that system so that there are as little or few distractions as possible. Uh, also, we'd have to consider a cutoff age. Do we want seven-year-olds in the nursery? No. See, you got to cut it off. Where do we cut it off? Well, every kid's different. One kid, maybe at age two, is ready to come out here. The next kid, maybe at age four, still needs some time. So it, it's, it's really hard to say. We're going to have to approach that one, one by one. All right, now turn your Bible to Psalm 131. Give you one other thought from the Bible on this. As far as what we will do in our new location, once we have our own area to uh, to build as we see fit, we might actually try a bit, of the, a bit of both, where you can arrange with other parents, right? You can trade weeks, and somebody can watch your child in the nursery, and, you know, m uh, two moms can pair up and, and take turns watching the other ones, something like that, and then still allow other We There's lots of ideas, and as we approach that, we'll try to make as smart of an idea as we can, but here's what we can do as parents and as a church. Psalm 131 and verse number 2. And if you don't mind, let's read verse 1 with it. I want you to see David speaking here about maturity. Lord, my heart is not haughty. Uh, another word for proud or lifted up. My heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in matters, uh, in great matters, or in things too high for me. I'm not going to take on more than I can handle. I won't bite off more than I can chew. Now, this is something that comes with experience and maturity, right? You start to learn, I'm, what am I proving by taking on too much? David knows his limits. Right? Okay, now verse 2. Surely I have behaved and quieted, what's the next word? Myself. I have behaved and quieted myself. That's his responsibility. Yeah? Now, it is you as adults, I think we have this figured out. I hope so. None of you are pitching a fit and throwing a tantrum and crying. I hope not in the middle of Sunday school, right? That would be very awkward. <laughs> but you have learned at some point to behave and quiet yourself. You have learned some self-discipline, right? That's what we call it, self-discipline. Your child has none of that. They don't come pre-programmed with discipline. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. At some point in your life, somebody taught you to sit down and be quiet. I hope. <laughs> Some adults haven't learned that, right? A amen. Some adults have. I'm not talking to anyone in this room. I'm more in Parliament, but <laughs> they don't know how to sit. <laughs> Come on now. 
Have you ever watched any of that? Honorable member, honorable member. Ah, ah, you know, honorable member. Ah, ah, it's just a zoo. It, it, it's, it's madness. It's utter confusion. For hours, they just go on talking over each other. They have not learned to behave and quiet themselves, right? Okay, let, let me not go down that bunny trail any farther. But at, the kids don't come pre-programmed with discipline. Mom and dad, you train them. You offer discipline where they don't have it. That's what training is. It's discipline, right? It's the same word. So train them up. Give them discipline. Booty sissy, it's time to sit down and be quiet. Now, you start learning this at home. You train them at home. You don't come to church and say, okay, on Sunday we'll work on this, and the other six days you let them run wild. You, this is something not just for church. This is a life lesson. You should be teaching your kids how to be a part of your home, how to be a part of their church, and ultimately a part of society starting at a very young age. Now, granted, guys, they're not going to get it immediately. It's going to take not weeks, not even months, but a few years probably before they fully realize what it means and how important it is to sit down and be quiet. Look at verse 2. I, I know we've only read part of it, so let's see how this works into children. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. A weaned child. At what, at what age do you wean a child? Well, again, that's different for every child. There is no biblical age for weaning. It's not like two years old, now you, that's, that's the end of that period. That you, you, you just have to adjust to each child. Samuel, right, if you remember the story of Hannah, she said, I will take him to the temple after I have weaned him. Now, I think Hannah probably drug out that process as long as she could, right? She probably dragged it out for a while because she knew I'm going to lend, lend my son to the Lord. I'm not going to see him. So she probably drugged that out about a bit long, but I would guess Samuel to be five or six years old by the time she took him down to the house of God. But, and that's when the weaning process was fully done. So maybe that's the high end. But most kids, what, two-ish, plus minus, I, I, I'm guessing, maybe. But we have a bit of a, of, a, of a compass in this verse. By that age, now l listen to this, parents. By that age, we're aiming to have them behaving and quiet. That's what we're aiming for. We're not expecting perfection, right? There are going to be moments that you need to take them out and explain, no, no, this isn't time for that, right? But by that, by that age, we're looking to, this is about the time we expect them to know better than to be throwing fits and temper tantrums and yelling and screaming and talking when somebody else is talking. They should be starting to learn some politeness and some quietness. There, kind of like you guys are doing now. <laughs> well behaved. Good church. Good church. <laughs> you say, well, pastor, you don't know my kid. Yeah, that's great. That sounds great. And, you know, I, I see that in verse 2, and it makes sense. But you don't know my kid. Okay, you don't know my kids either. <laughs> we, every mom and dad, and this is how we feel, our kids are exceptional. <laughs> and I mean that in a good way, but <laughs> we're looking at your kids going, oh, they're exceptional. Oh, they're, they're exceptional. <laughs> they are a rare breed, let me tell you. <laughs> now, guys, let, let's be honest. Every kid... Is, is different with this, but every kid has energy. To keep a one-and-a-half or a two-year-old sitting in a service for two hours straight, right, because we have a, approximately that long in our Sunday school, then we get a break, thank God, they can go run some of that energy out for 10, 15 minutes, come back, and to sit for another hour, that's asking a lot of a two-year-old. It really is, and I get it, I get it. So when you say, but Pastor, you don't understand, my kid has a lot of energy, good. I get it. That's not a bad thing. That just means your job as a parent is going to be that much more challenging. It doesn't mean you give up on the challenge. Rise to that challenge. Patiently train them, and if I can use the term, conquer their will. Conquer their will. They will battle you on it, but it is, it is a lesson worth learning for them. Because if you can get them trained at a young age to quiet themselves then when they get to school later at, at uh, high school or at, get to university or they get a job, they'll know how to go to the office, sit in the meeting, be quiet while the boss is speaking. It's not your turn to speak. Be quiet. Listen. If he already knows that, if he doesn't have to learn that the hard way, you have helped him tremendously. 
right, tremendously. All right, so a couple of other ideas. Um, Parents, you try to train your children to behave and sit and be quiet in church. If they fail, right, the Bible on a couple of occasions says this, submit thyself. Remember verses like that? Submit thyself. It says, humble thyself. Now, these are commandments that God is giving to us. He says, you do it. I don't want to do it for you. So, parents, you are our first line of defense. They are your kids. We will leave it to you to quiet those kids, right? Now, ideally, they will learn to quiet themselves. But if they can't quiet themselves, then we leave it to you. You quiet them. But if there is a time during a service when a child is acting up, right, the last thing we want to do is have to send an usher over to that parent and say, I, sorry, we have an area back here. And we have done that a couple of times. It's never comfortable. It's always awkward. Always awkward. In Malawi, we didn't have ushers. So when a baby got too loud, and every now and again, it did. It got too loud. I can preach through a lot of noise, and I did. Kids would scream and, and cry, and mothers would just work through it. Malawi, I, I'd stop and ask, can you guys hear me? They go, yeah, yeah, just preach, just preach. It's okay. It's okay, shop. So, okay, I can't even hear myself, but off we go. Now, I, I, there was a couple of times where I stopped and I said, uh, sorry, 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 mama, please, the, take the baby out. She said, oh, oh, Pepa, sorry, sorry. And then, that's awkward. We don't want to get to that point, right? So moms, dads, please help us out with this. When you realize that ah, my child is getting a bit, you know, antsy for whatever reason, you take it upon yourselves to do whatever is necessary. Maybe you adjust something where they're seated or take them out. Fix whatever the issue is. At the very last, the last thing we want to do is send somebody to say, hey, can we help out? At, because we're, this is causing a bit of a distraction, right? We don't want to do that. But as a church, what's the purpose of coming together? Listen and learn. And if that distraction is not going away, we cannot ignore it. You say, but that's going to make them uncomfortable. Yes, I, I get it. It's true. But we have two choices here. We either risk offending them or risk wasting our time in the church service. You see? And, and as nicely as we can, we're going to choose option A. We're not trying to offend anyone, but say, please, we're, we want to have church. And we can't do that with this current situation. Now, parents... I will leave it to you, all the particulars of how you quiet them down, how you get them to sit still. I, that's it. I'm going to leave that to you. This coming Saturday, we're going to have that parenting class. I'll give you a few extra ideas there, but this isn't the time and place for that. Now, let me turn our attention to one other side of this. I've spoken to the parents now, your responsibility. What about us as a church, every member? What do we do? Be patient. Now here, if you don't have kids or young kids here in the church service, this is your part of the lesson. Be patient. Be patient. If maybe some of you older folks, you've had kids. You get it. You get it, right? I know how it feels. I'm looking at it going, how, how, how is it you cannot manage your child? And I am quick to forget I had children once. <laughs> now, I, I will admit, for me, it's very different because most of the time, if I'm in church, I'm up here, right? I'm preaching. So really, this is where it would be ideal for my wife to step up for a moment and tell you the great struggles that she had to keep our children quiet. And, you know, they presented their own challenges. She did a masterful job at it because we were in a different church every service, right? We just traveled around America for almost two years, different church, different church. It was tough with a three-year-old and a one-year-old. It was not easy. So here's some advice, parents, just for a moment. Ask some of these people that have raised kids in a church, how'd you manage that? And, and listen, I know that, that my kids may not be the same as yours, and not everything we tried may work for you. I get that, but at least ask. You might be able to get one little nugget or two, right, that you might be able to apply to your own children. But you older folks, don't forget that you had kids at one time also. Now, you younger folks never had kids. Maybe you're looking at it going, I don't get it. It's not that hard. Just take, oh, you'll get it one day. You'll get it. You'll understand. And, and, and you'll be praying, going, God, please forgive me for being so impatient. I'm so sorry, God. Please. And, and the verse that says you'll reap what you've sowed, be real careful. Sow a lot of patience. <laughs> Sow a lot of patience now because you'll need it once you become a parent. So as a church, 
let's be kind and gentle and patient and helpful as much as we can. We want to do what we can to accommodate the little kids being around. Be patient. Understand that mom and dad, is they're learning as well. While that child is learning how to stay quiet in church, mom and dad is learning how to keep them quiet in church. For most parents, right, especially child number one, by the time you get to child number three, four, six, seven, you know, you got to figure it out a little bit better. But child number one, that's always the greatest challenge. I, even though your, you know, grandma will tell you how to do it, and you, you got ooms and tannies all around you telling you how to do it, you're still learning as a mom and dad. So church, let's be patient with that. Let's not be so, what can I say, set on edge that we're here in church, we're here for the word, and if a baby cries, <gasps> let's not all turn around and stare at the mom and go, come on! <laughs> let's... <laughs> Just, just, just roll with it, right? Just roll with it. Hey, it happens, and, and on we go. <clears throat> I'm going to ask one, one request. In the back, right? The, the back rows, I think it is a wonderful idea if we can leave the back, I don't know, two, three, four rows maybe, available for young families. Or let's say families with young ones. Can I say it that way? Because they are probably going to be the ones that need to slip in and out quietly. And in a lot of churches, they do this, and maybe we'll do this in our new building. They put ropes on the back few rows and, and put a little sign that says reserved for families, right? Uh, and furthermore, this, this frees up the next, you get promoted, right? Once, once your children learn how to behave, then you move forward. <laughs> you come to the head of the class, <laughs> that type of thing. But, but it really does help the families, right? Now, we also want to have seating for visitors. And, you know, sometimes, if you're a visitor, it's not easy to walk to the front of the church and sit down in a brand new place, right? So we want to have some seats available for people that are a bit new or for families that need to come in and out. So I'm just making that request. Just be aware of that. Um, if there are some parents with young ones, maybe even trade seats with them. Say, I'll take, you take my seat back here, I'll, I'll move forward a bit. I think that would be a, a good way to help them out and accommodate them. Now, I'll finish the lesson just by saying this, and then you'll have plenty of time in the sunshine, right? I, I told you there's, not, there's no verses to show you beyond what I've shown you uh, for dealing with kids in church, so this won't be a long lesson. But here's the bottom line. If you want to participate in the services, then you'll find a way. You'll find a way to manage your children and be here. Moms, dads, please do not use your children as an excuse to not participate in church. If you want to be in church and you want to get something out of it, when your kids are, you know, when you're getting, uh, let's say, getting started as a family, there are, it's going to be tough to get a lot out of the church service. You're going to be distracted. I get that. But if you want to get something out of it, you'll try. And you'll work and you'll try this and try that and spend time in the nursery and come in and out of the service, but you'll try. You'll make that effort. If you want to be a part of the church, then you'll show up and you'll try. Do not put your child up as a barrier between you and the Holy Spirit. And say, well, Lord, I would... I would like to do more, but, but my child. Don't use them as an excuse. It might be a challenge, and it will take some work, but work that is worth it. Work that is worth it. As a church, God help us, we'll be patient with you. The Lord will be patient with you. Right? Be patient with yourselves, but make that effort. Make that effort. Let's all stand, if you would, please. All right, Father. I've told them everything that, uh, that you showed me on this subject. And Lord, as we go, continue to teach us what we can do, what we can change. I pray that you'd help each and every parent. Lord, it is a challenge. I pray you'd help them to take on that challenge and, and uh, not give up. But Lord, patiently nurture those children up in the admonition of the Lord. I pray that you bless our service to come, our fellowship now. Thank you for the sunshine outside. We can warm up a bit. Lord, we thank you for letting us come together today for church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you guys enjoy the soul and sky.